Um, thank you so much for joining us for this morning's webinar focused on innovative and creative partnerships and business structures in agroforestry. I hope everyone who's joining us is safe and well from where they are and much gratitude to each of you for making space to build community and learn from each other during this busy spring season. My name is Katie Adams and I am the Illinois Community Agroforester here at the Savannah Institute and my co-host is Michelle Mansky, our event coordinator. I will be facilitating this morning and Michelle will be, cu be curating audience questions and providing technical assistance behind the scenes. If you're joining us through a computer, we invite you to share your questions and comments in the chat, uh, in the chat box of the platform at any time. You should be able to find that th down at the bottom of your screen. If you have any issues with that, uh, please just let us know. Hopefully we're all comfortable with Zoom, but we're happy to help in whatever way we can. Um, we will monitor all of the questions that come through the chat throughout the, throughout the conversation today, and we'll make sure to address them during the Q&A session at the end. And just as an FYI, everyone will be muted for better sound quality as this webinar will be recorded. The Savannah Institute is a nonprofit organization based out of Wisconsin and Illinois, focused on widespread agroforestry research and education in the Midwest, United States, and beyond. We truly believe that widespread agroforestry can help restore soil, build resilience, and support strong economies of cooperation between farmers, change makers, researchers, and perennial, agri or perennial industry builders. And now that we've introduced ourselves, it's time to introduce our guests. We are honored to welcome Kathy Capel and Darren Bender Beauregard this morning. Kathy is the shepherd at Seven Sisters Farm in East Central Illinois. In addition to lamb, she sells high quality fleeces to hand spinners, as well as, that, as well as to a local woman that has them mill processed into designer yarn. In 2015, she leased 10 acres to a young energetic grad student for an agroforestry project. And then the biggest revelation so far is that sheep love currants. I do too. Kathy lives on the farm with a jazz musician, her husband, Ken, five dogs, 23 sheep, and 15 chickens. Our second guest today is Darren, who along with Esbri Bender Beauregard operate Brambleberry Farm, a small permaculture-based farm in Southern Indiana. The main farming enterprise is a perennial fruit, nut, and berry nursery that focuses on selling appropriate species, cultivars, and rootstocks for plants that are likely to succeed in the specific ecology of their region. The farm is also includes sections of developed and developing silvopasture with rotationally grazed cattle, as well as meat and show rabbits, laying hens, and other ons and ends. Kathy and Darren, thank you so much for joining us today and sharing your wisdom, knowledge, and passion. Uh, to kick us off, I'd love for you each to give us a little bit of the lay of the land where you are and how you came to steward your farm. Darren, would you like to go first? Sure. Um, well, uh, we are in Paoli, south, very south central Indiana. If, those of you that think you know Indiana and have been in the northern half, we're in the hilly, uh, wooded half of the state um, and very different than the north. Um, we are on a ridge top and we are um, doing our farming enterprises on my wife of Spree's uh, parents' property. She grew up here on this property um, and we moved back after college and started what we've been doing. Uh, we started out as a small vegetable, um, organic vegetable operation with a small CSA and selling at farmer's markets. Um, but we knew we wanted to someday move into perennial based uh, income source from perennial based plants. Um, we didn't quite know what at the time, but um, we slowly moved uh, from vegetables into a nursery, um, which is what we what we run today. Uh, along the way, and what we're talking about today, we um, we had hosted many many sort of traditional farm apprentices who uh, contacted us, wanted to uh, work on a farm and um, learn as much as they could in exchange for helping out, um, and we did our best to host host many of them. But along the way, we realized we'd like something that's a little more like offer a little more opportunity um, to uh, people seeking to learn how to farm um, to be on the land. And so share a little more about that 
in a bit. So I'll pass it, pass the mic to Kath. Okay. Um, I've been interested in farming for as long as I can remember, but I was never in a position to have a farm of my own. So I had kids and got married and worked for my, for most of my adult life, but various relatives had farms. So I was really familiar with, especially the ecosystem, the timber soil ecosystem in Illinois, which is just off the creeks. You know, there's the flat prairie black soils, but between the flat prairie black soils and the creeks is the timber soil area. And that's, there's bottomland and swamp and then the savanna and then the prairie. Um, so I had had some experience with sheep as a young woman. Um, my last enterprise that I sold was a boarding stable and I went looking for a farm and found this one, which is, we're about a quarter mile off the salt, the salt fork. Um, I have sheep, I usually raise turkeys and broilers, but this year I am busy with a lot of other stuff. So I'm not opting not to do that this year, but I do have some layers still and, uh, and the sheep. And that's, and, and yeah, and we do some gardening, but mostly I focus on the sheep. Kathy, you have a long-term lease agreement with an agroforestry farmer at your farm, Seven Sisters. Um, I'd love to hear a little bit more about that and how you initially met your partner. I met Kevin Waltz, the co-founder of the Savannah Institute, in 2014, either at or right after a presentation given by Mark Shepard at the Specialty Crops Conference in Springfield, Illinois. I was really interested, I had owned this property since 2007, and I was really interested in reestablishing basically a timber soil ecology here. Um, it was primary, it, as much of it was, that was arable was in corn and soybeans, and it was really pretty sterile, pretty low production like timber soil is. Um, he was finishing his PhD and really anxious to get started in his agroforestry projects. And so uh, our goals and our goals clicked. And so we developed, with the help of the uh, farm commons, we developed a long-term lease. And now my sheep graze between rows of currants that they've eaten to the ground and uh, trees. And we've got a really nice windbreak and a pollinator strip and it's, it's much, it's going in the right direction. How did that initial conversation start between like meeting and, and talking about shared goals? Who, who, was that, who approached who first around this I idea think, of renting? I think Mark may have put us together. And the conversation about renting developed over the course of a year. Kevin had some field, field days at the university and I attended those and uh, just sort of hung around the edge and then had an opportunity to talk to him and sort of begged, you can use it. <laughs> it, worked, it worked pretty well because it just, it, it was apparent to me that our goals matched, but I didn't know if the, my property was appropriate. But we were in the third year of an alfalfa plant. Um, we would planted alfalfa to try to start the recovery process from the um, conventional corn and soybeans. And so that worked out really well because that, that provided the boost that Kevin needed to get started with the agroforestry project. You mentioned that Farm Commons help you put together a lease. At what point in the conversation did Farm Commons come on board? Were they they're kind of at the very beginning or? Um... Kevin used Farm Commons as a resource basically. And I think he brought them in probably pretty early, as soon as he was thinking about it, because the it's a relatively new, at that time, it was pretty new, a long-term agricultural lease. 
um, involving perennial crops. And he needed some creative help and I think some legal help to develop something. And a, a contract is basically an exploration of all the questions that might come up over the course of the lease in an attempt to resolve them and prevent conflict. So um, Farm Commons had the, the perspective to be able to help with that. Thanks so much for that overview, Kathy. I like the way that you described a contract as a series of questions and answers to help prevent conflict. That, uh, that absolutely every contract I've been a party to has been, that's been my goal for it. Darren, you have a little bit of a different situation at Brambleberry Farm. You run an incubator program there. How did that start? Well, uh, how, kind of I was saying earlier, we we got more and more sort of dissatisfied, not dissatisfied, just sort of um, with, with traditional farm apprenticeship um, kind of set up where we had people working for us five days a week. Um, we always had to find things for them to do. Um, and it was hard for us to kind of work on some of our own tasks that were more, you know, focused and we needed to kind of have focused time. Um, and we started trying to think how we could do some kind of a apprenticeship uh, type thing without having to uh, manage people five days a week. Um, we also had happened around the same time to move out of our former home, uh, which was an old house trailer that we got and was all we could really afford at the time and fixed up um, to a pretty nice space um, to our current home, which is a straw bale house um, right behind me here. Um, and so we had this empty trailer that, you know, we could post apprentices in for three months out of the year and then it would sit empty probably. And, you know, an empty trailer over the winter is not a great, not a great thing in any, any regard. So um, we were sort of inspired a bit by um, Mark Shepard's setup, which, which was focused a little less on apprenticeships um, and more on finding ways for people to layer into your current um, land base and land use. Um, you know, there's with agroforestry and permaculture and all this stuff, uh, no matter what school of thought you're approaching it, it seems like as you look into a deeper and more diverse style of farming, um, you all of a sudden start seeing just niches everywhere. Um, I mean, just, oh, you could grow, you know, ginseng and, you know, shade loving plants in the understory of this forest that we've thinned out or, or you know, grow medicinal uh, sun loving things in the tree rows before they're mature. Uh, but I, you know, you realize quickly you, as a farmer, I only have, you know, so much time to spare and you can't do it all. So, um, you know, I thought, and Mark was sort of approaching that with, um, as I understand it, you know, inviting people to come, uh, live on the land, uh, build a dwelling place and um, start, find work with him, I guess, and work with them to start their own enterprise to make their own money um, or grow what they're wanting to grow. And then kind of work together to layer in and kind of coexist or have a mutually beneficial um, enterprises. So we um, I remember reading an article he wrote about that um, and it kind of just spurred some thoughts. And then our family kind of just developed this idea of a farm incubator, which we'd never really heard anybody doing this. We just kind of came up with that name for it. Um, the idea is that um, we don't really want to grow vegetable, annual vegetables anymore, but a lot of other people that have worked on um, organic vegetable farms and we're looking for land of their own to um, grow, to start their own farm on, um, might like to have the opportunity to sort of try their hand at that with little or no money invested uh, before they take the plunge and, you know, get a loan or try and find land and start everything from them from scratch themselves. Um, you know, we had about three quarters of an acre we were growing vegetables on that um, had turned into really nice soil. And we thought, you know, that'd be a great resource uh, for people to use. We had an old chicken house, a one acre pasture. 
pasture, um, a lot of tools, a barn to use for storage for things. And so we put the word out to our same networks um, that we had looked for apprentices on and just sort of put this new opportunity up. And thankfully, you know, the first year we posted, we got um, a young couple um, who came and just, I mean, they just lived fully into that whole thing and did an amazing job. They're excellent farmers, they're still farming. Um, and, um, you know, within two years made a really, really nice business out of um, growing vegetables. Um, and, you know, in the meantime, the land that, you know, we had been cultivating stayed tended um, by humans. And we also got to learn things from them and um, offer our advice from our experience farming as well. Uh, it seemed to just really be a good, a pretty win-win situation. Um, so after two years, they moved on and we found, you know, you know, a few other individuals and couples that have been here since and have really just found it to be a, a really, um, yeah, there's very, I feel like there's very few downfalls in what we've experienced so far. There's some challenges, but um, we can talk about that later. But that's essentially what um, what we've done. And we, as far as contracts, we, we wrote up an MOU ourselves um, and uh, took a three-page MOU. And just like Kathy said, it's so much of it is aimed at trying to think about potential um, conflict areas um, that might arise and address those in a document that both parties can read and sign before entering into the agreement. And I mean, for the most part, it has solved, uh, yeah, it's, it's done so much to help um, keep things clear, which is always seems to be the best thing to do when in a relationship. So. Can you talk about um, both Darren, you and Kathy, talk a little bit about what some of those features are and like what potential conflicts you're looking to hedge with either the MOU or the lease that, that Kathy has? Um, I can go ahead. I'll just, um, yeah, a lot of ours involves tool use or machine use um, where, um, you know, it's clear that, you know, you're the farm incubator uh, folks are able to use tools and machines that we have. Um, but if we are needing them, we have priority. Um, just that's clear. You know, if we need a tiller or a rake or a shovel, um, they're welcome to use it. But if we're currently using it, um, we sort of have first rights to that. Um, um, and then if a tool breaks, um, there's a clear, it's fairly clearly set out that Um, the, you know, they would help replace the tool or repair it. Um, and some of the tools like tillers and chainsaws and things that have really high wear um, inherent in their use, we actually set up a monetary per hour fee for use because, I mean, anyone that uses chainsaws knows that, you know, every hour you spend running it is, is probably half an hour of sharpening and um, cleaning and all that stuff. So, um, so we just set that up to make it clear that, hey, here's this thing you can use, but if you're going to use it, you know, 10, 20 hours a month, you might be better off just buying, buying one yourself. But at least we have our bases covered. Um, the other things involve um, upkeep of the property, um, like the housing that they have and the land around it. So it doesn't just completely get out of hand. Um, we're not expecting, you know, suburban um, subdivision quality, uh, but just not letting things go completely crazy and swallow up the entire house or anything like that. So, but just laying some of that stuff out so that we know that that's something that we sort of expect. And if we see that it's not happening, we can sort of tap them on the shoulder and say, hey, you know, um, yeah, one way we have to um, try to try to also avoid conflict or at least bring it to the surface before it becomes a problem is that we have quarterly check-ins. So um, every quarter a year, we set up a time, um, usually in the evening after work um, or after supper, um, to just 
come and meet and bring anything to the table that feel you feel like you've been sort of noticing or um you know things that might be creeping up or sort of wearing on on each other or opportunities you know that like hey we're dreaming about this but you know we haven't had the space to really sit down and talk with you so it's just really just carving out simple as carving out space and time to um intentionally um check in with with each other and see how things are going which has been really valuable um so if that's good for me i'll let kathy meet myself okay what was the question katie the the question was around um what are some specific examples of ways that you are hedging conflict within the confines of your lease with kevin the i think the main conflict that we're going to encounter is succession because i'm not going to live forever and i will probably predecease the end of the lease certainly and um, certainly predeceased the um, Savannah Institute being active on my land. And so that the way we've addressed it is we've made it possible for my kids to sell the land. I'm considering leasing a larger, actually we're working on a lease for a larger um, acreage. And I think that one I'm gonna put a conser conservation easement on so that it will always be in farmland and I'll prevent my kids from selling it for anything but agriculture. But this one is only 20 acres and it's really not big enough to do something like that on. So um, yeah, it's like what happens to the trees, all that kind of stuff. And so, and I think we've, we've dealt with it relatively well. Um, it just, it, 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 it's hard to know the future. And how long is your lease, Kathy, with Kevin? I can't remember. I haven't, I didn't pull it up, but I think it's 99 years. Yeah, I actually do know the answer to that question, and it is 99 years. Yeah, it was either 50 or 99 years. This, the lease for the other property will probably be 50. But Kevin wanted, Kevin wanted 99 years. I'll just say that a 99 year lease is the longest legal lease in Illinois and other states have different long-term lease structures. Yeah. With a, with a lease that long, um, you know, Darren's program is you know, on a year or bi-yearly basis. Um, how, does, how does rent get paid on a lease that long, Kathy? The rent's based on the going rate for cash rent on that type of farmland. Um, and I've also, right now I'm getting USDA money for the pollinator strip and the windbreak, but I, presumably that'll be renewed, but that's, you know, maybe yes, maybe no. Um, so, but yeah, basically it's just structured based on the, the going rate for farmland for cash rent. And is that a yearly rent payment? Yes, it's annual. One unique structure of your lease with Kevin is around the price of trees on the property. Can you talk a little bit about the trees that were planted there and, and who paid for what? The way we set it up was that I, was, I paid for the plant material. Kevin paid for premium genetics on that plant material if that was what he chose to do. And then he's responsible for establishment and maintenance, I think for five years. And after that, there's a sliding scale of who owes who what for, for 20 years and at 20 years we're even. And essentially after 20 years, ending the lease is not that hard. If you know, nobody owes anybody, but if my kids decide to sell it in 20 years, then it's, it, there's really no, it's just a matter of um, providing notice, written notice. I, the first time I heard about that, uh, that way of uh, paying for trees, it was really astounding 
because it showed kind of like mutual commitment to the enterprise at hand. Yeah, unfortunately, the results of premium genetics on timber soil was not impressive because the plants seem to be needier than native genetics. We have the windbreak is all native. And so the windbreak is done really well. But some of the, especially I felt really bad about those currents that the sheep just gobbled right up. But that was, that was part of it. It was no matter how well they were protected, the sheep still seemed to get to them. So that also, leads pretty, oh, go ahead, Kathy. They also weren't very happy because the soil's not well enough drained for currents. So that's a, a really good example of something that can possibly happen when kind of two enterprises are coexisting together on, on one piece of land. Um, how did you and Kevin talk about uh, the, the sheep eating the currants and was that, uh, a hard conversation or was it something like, oh, we now we know sort of there situation. There was no conversation until Kevin had a sense of humor about it. <laughs> but I think based on the fact that the currents were actually doing very poorly anyway, and he had kind of decided to pursue a different enterprise out here, it was okay. But in a different situation, we would have had to create fencing to keep the sheep out of the currents. Darian, have you encountered any challenging situations um, with folks that you've worked with at Brambleberry? So far, we've been pretty calm, calm seas, calm waters. Um, you know, we haven't had, most of it has involved uh, pets, um, mostly dogs that um, people have brought that have been a little, little uh, friskier, I guess, than we would like in coming over and maybe bothering our animals or more likely bothering customers that came out, come out to buy plants. Um, um, so we've, you know, that's the main thing we've had to have discussions about with, but you know, the people where that's been a problem, it's always been, you know, the, the, I don't know, there's no good word for the people in the farm incubators uh, um, program, but uh, they've always been pretty gracious and understanding about things and tried to train or, um, have a dog on leash or a pen or invisible fence to kind of prevent that. So um, that's been the main thing. Um, the only other thing was um, one couple was interested in potentially talking about long term, like buying a chunk of the property and potentially building a house here to ah. stay long term. And that, um, you know, I I thought that would be a really cool idea, but um, I I'm not. It's not my uh, immediate like my blood family's um, property that's been here. Um, and so when we talked about it with everybody that owns the property, um, people weren't interested in, in sectioning off anything. So um, yeah, and I think that's part of the reason they moved on um, too. I mean, it was no hard feelings. I don't, as far as I'm concerned, but or by, to my knowledge, but it's just, well, you know, this isn't, this isn't really set up to be a long-term thing. What we we aim it's a minimum of one year, with one year renewals up, and then we say up to three years. Um, if we found someone was a really good fit and they wanted to keep going with it, I don't think we'd be opposed to that. But um, that's been, as far as conflict, kind of the, about the main thing that we've run into. Have thankfully. What are some of the big benefits of these types of partnerships? Each of you has touched on that briefly a little bit, but I'd love to hear more about um, what sort of uh, both like tangible and intangible benefits these partnerships bring to, to your farm, or I would say even to your life. Well, do you want me to go or do you want to go, Kat? <laughs> You go, you go, Darren. Okay. I don't want to hog the space, but um, I would say first and foremost, like you said, the invisible things you don't think about, Katie. I, to me, um, and this is just from my standpoint, Esprit might have a different um, different thing, but there's something about having humans that are interested in growing in sustainable ways, growing food um, on a piece of land that I am, I mean, just deeply 
deeply believe in that, that, that humans um, can do great good um, to regenerate land and, and grow food in the process. So to me, there is like just a core innate um, value in having people here um, tending a piece of land, I'll bite a small piece of land, um, you know, that we once tended. And when I walk over and see things, you know, happening on this land that we started out, and it was just, you know, bush hog pasture when we started. And there's just, watch that go through different changes with different hands and the way they do things differently. Um, but just knowing that it's being continued, there's, there's just this sort of innate value I have in that. So I'd say that's the biggest one for me is just, you know, the, the satisfaction of knowing a space is being cared for. Um, but boy, the other tangible ones, I mean, there are so many, I'm sure Kathy, you're going to bring a bunch more too, but you know, having one or two other pairs of hands that are right next door, if you need to help lift something or to, you know, drop something with, you know, a tractor, you know, guide you and there's no one else around. It's just more people there to kind of help, um, more people to kind of have great conversation with as you're ending the work day. Um, and, um, you know, that kind of, com so community aspect is, is huge too. Um, but then for us, probably the biggest like practical one is that we offer um, either uh, the, the folks can pay a set amount of rent for that um, space um, or they can do a work exchange um, for that and work with us in our nursery and around the farm. And to have people that are living right next door um, that are committed to being here for a full year, they almost all of them want to learn as much as they can about um, all different types of farming. Um, it's just, I feel like it's killing like so many birds with one stone um, and just seems to be a very synergistic uh, thing and no brainer, a huge benefit for us. So I'll stop there and let Kathy bring some hers. I think my benefits are from a higher elevation to some extent. Um, from a financial standpoint, I'm not going to get rich doing this, but this process has made it possible for me to move closer to financial, my financial goals with the sheep. Um, there's an aspect of visibility, too, that is, has created a lot of interest in the farm and in agroforestry, too. Um, it also gives me joy to see this farm come back to having life, to have perennials, to have wildlife, to have, the birds are just crazy this year, all kinds of birds. Um, every year there's more birds, more wildlife. We've had, there's three bald eagles checking the place out pretty regularly now. Um, lots of nesting going on over at the pollinator strip and in the windbreak. It also gives me a lot of joy to contribute even a little bit to the well-being of the people that are involved in the projects, to my community, and to the planet. It just, it just, it's, it makes me feel part of a really big web and really connected. And I think I feel selfish because <laughs> That, that's so that's been that's become really important to me yeah and I just want to thank Kathy uh, I came to work in agroforestry because of Kathy and a shared position with Seven Sisters Farm and, and Kevin Wools and uh, being able to work with both partners on the ground was an absolutely invaluable experience teaching and friendship wise uh, that I'm just incredibly grateful for. So the relationships radiate, radiate out much farther than just the landscape, I'll add as well. Okay. <laughs> um, what advice would you give, Kathy, to, to landowners that are, are thinking about uh, uh, this type of creative partnership? Um, I think that the most important part is to understand your own goals and motivations. 
And I think you also have to understand your limitations in terms of whatever your financial limitations are. But you have to have a pretty strong sense of what your boundaries are um, initially. Um, I would say be open and be flexible. Follow your passion. Respect the people you're dealing with. I mean, that's a choice. And, and deal with people in good faith. But, and communicate really clearly. Um, that, but yeah, I mean, advocate for yourself and for your goals and visions, but share those goals and visions and seek that in someone up that would be a particular partner that shares those things. I love that emphasis on goals and visions. I think I think that's key. Darren, would you have anything to add from your end? Um, I, I totally second communication. I mean, it just seems like when you enter into something like this, communication is of utmost importance. And if you let that slide, that it's it's only a matter of time until the cows get to the fence. You know that you left the electric off of. So to speak, um, I'd say um, other thing to be aware of is this is still seem, seems to be a pretty new and like a very, in a very, there's, I just don't know a whole lot of people doing this type of thing, but, and yet I think it's essential in some ways. And so just know that you're sort of in a pioneering, um, pioneering group of people wanting to do this with land and and that it's going to be i think every situation is going to be a little different um and i th i'd say yeah test your risks um come to a place where you're comfortable with the amount of risk that you're entering into and take appropriate measures to um, deal with those um so that, so that you're you're not going to be anxious or uh, worried about it um yeah and i th think um yeah, I'd say it's about what I'd have to say for advice. And on the flip side, what about farmers or potential producers? Uh, what what advice would you give folks like me um, that are that are in the the situation of looking for long term land access? I would say, I would say. Um, don't give up and i feel like there's tremendous potential and the only thing that is blocking it or limiting it is just cr is creativity or lack of creativity um that i think um but i think unfortunately right now it, it probably is more on that side of the equation that we that people that are looking for these type of opportunities are the ones that are going to probably be the ones that have to go and help create them um but i mean maybe maybe hopefully we'll get to a point where there's there's a nice balance of both um it's not so hard but i yeah i'd say um i'd say also be careful um i've heard i've heard with just general leases and things that it can be really um uh, is that that is not me um yeah i'd say it's good just just be careful. Don't don't give too much. I guess. So. How about from your end, Kathy? What it, what advice would you give to to farmers or producers? I think the keep trying is really important. But I do think again that you've got to your vision has to match the landowner's vision at least to some extent. So you have to seek a situation that that works for you. Um, I think what. Darren said about not giving away the farm is really important. You know, don't shortchange your own security for an opportunity that may or may not be real. Um, and then just open communication. Look for somebody who is respectful of you and you respect, you know, mutual respect and, and good faith. I mean, and you just, I think to some extent you have to be able to operate within relationships, interpersonal relationships, with some amount of uh, confidence. 
in order to establish the kind of land relationship you're going to want. Yeah, that that keyword is relationship, right? Yeah. So much of this is is built on that. And I feel like this is kind of a larger, maybe more more cultural question, um, but beyond kind of land leases and um, partnerships, how how can we encourage more folks to to enter into these types of mutually beneficial relationships, whether it be through agroforestry or or beyond in different different parts of our society. I think for me, it's what's important to me is to demonstrate success in every way. Um, for because agroforestry happens to be my passion, I'm willing to engage that larger acreage in a, in a lease. Hopefully, create a demonstration area, and it also it demonstrations not the demonstrations include not just agroforestry, but a lease, a relationship, the possibility, and, and like there are infinite possibilities. And I think that it's just a matter of pointing out how many opportunities there actually are on a given piece of ground. And there's, you know, there, somebody is bound to find a vision or a passion in some part of it. It just, it's like build it and they will come, you know. Yeah, I, I agree. I think that it's, it's the only limit. It's like a nesting doll, you know, just you just keep opening and there's more and more little dolls that the further you go down, um, you know, to the microbial level and out to the universal level. It's just, there's, I feel like there's just creativity is, can open up so many things. But um, I think, yeah, the example is a good thing, being examples and having working examples um, to, visit and see how it's working and what's working what's not um kind of like we're doing today to help kind of crack crack this phenomenon open a little more um to make it more available to people um i've heard just kind of through the grapevine i mean that there's so many retiring farmers that are the older generation that don't have any successors um and they're just gonna their land will probably just get bought and conglomerated with a larger um you know, larger farm and just keep getting added to bigger, bigger chunks. Um, and it's really sad. And, you know, I think that there's lots of opportunity for people to enter into relationships like this. But I also know that a lot of the same farmers like that don't have been burned a lot by the younger generation. And um, there's, you know, it's a, trust might be a hard thing to, to gain. And so um, I think a big thing is, a lot of the work that we all need to do is to help develop that trust and, and know that it's it's a worthwhile investment. Um, and if things don't work out, hopefully you can learn from it. But like Kathy said, I mean, some of the things, if it doesn't work out, you may have the farm taken from you um, if you gave too much or vice versa. You may have put a lot of time and energy into a place and just get booted off because of, you know, personality conflicts. And, um, and that's a shame. So I hope... Um, I think we just need a lot of brave people on both sides that are willing to jump in and try and figure it out. I would add that one of the challenges is succession. With all these farms, with older farmer owners, they don't want to deprive their kids of a livelihood or of the cash and the kids don't want to be deprived of it. And there aren't very many farmers that are willing to choose the well-being of the land and the community over the well-being of their kids. So that, that it may not be the farmers that we need to look at. It may need to be the next generation that's going to, the ones who are going to sell to the conglomerates. I don't know. I mean, th that's interesting because in doing what I'm doing, I'm definitely making the farm that my kids will inherit less valuable. Tough, 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 tough. Maybe, maybe in 10 years, that'll be way more valuable than that might be. A, blank, a, blank, a blank slate, who knows? Let's yeah, hope. Well, I can just see the farmer who wants to buy it bitching about the trees, yeah. 
Yeah, I feel like that's a an interesting way to to circle back around to values and making sure that number one that you have shared values both uh, both personally and culturally, but also when it comes to land value and, and property values, which are kind of key key in all of these all of these things. Um, land value and property value are two different things. I guess that. Thank you for that clarification. Can you explain maybe the difference for folks? Well, the land is its value as land and as as what it is as a as part of an ecosystem, as the eco services that it provides, in terms of fertility or whatever. And then property value is how much it's worth on the market in dollars. Yeah, I think that's a very important distinction to make in the, these types of partnerships as well. You know, that's interesting too, hearing, you know, this develop, it's just like that. And that's something we don't really, while we're young enough, I guess we're not too concerned about it. I'm sure we'll get there, but right now for us, it's not a matter of inheritance of people working here. It's sort of providing a space that we know is somewhat temporary. And so that, um, you know, fortunately or unfortunately, we don't, we don't worry too much about, you know, making sure the people that are here uh, working that land, you know, get to continue doing that after we're, uh, after we're gone. But um, yeah, but it's, it's interesting the two different sort of Yeah, it takes, Darren, it takes a while to get there, I'll tell you. I don't know if time is moving pretty fast. <laughs> <laughs> We're nearing the end of our time with Kathy and Darren. So if you have any questions, please drop them in the chat. Um, one thing that I'm interested in learning about is what is something that you're looking forward to in the coming year, um, either on your property or through your relationship uh, with your, your farm partner? We have, oh, go, I have a, oh, go ahead. Go, go, go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> okay, I've got two things. One is on my farm. I'm partnering with a friend who has a different breed of sheep, and I'm going to buy a ram from her. Well, she's. I'm going to trade her a ram for my the firstborn new lamb, um, and you know, tweak my fiber situation, which is always fun. But the other thing I'm really looking forward to is developing a relationship with the Savannah Institute on the farmland that's just east of Urbana. I'm just, I'm really looking forward to the lease and the easement process and getting started on that. That's awesome. That's cool that like, it's been such a good, a good uh, experience for you that you're excited to do that kind of work and expand that kind of opportunity. Really cool. Um, well, I'm excited. We just finished um, with our current, um, farm incubates, whatever the best good word is for it. Um, um, we talked with them and just finished planting a probably quarter acre um, mixed cane fruit, uh, bramble fruit uh, planting that um, we kind of worked together and came up with an agreement on that will split the harvest um, when they start um, bearing. Um, we, we footed the bill for the plants and um, installation and creating the raised beds and everything. And then they'll maintain uh, mowing and weeding and trellising the canes. And then we'll split the harvest when that comes. And it's cool because they knew, I mean, we were clear that this isn't something that's going to be bearing a lot of fruit the first year. You know, it'll be next year that we'll really see the main, um, main thing. But they seemed excited about it. And partly because this will be something that will stay with... Um, this will stay with the farm incubator thing. This will be a feature that will be added that people could in the future can move into this position and have a quarter acre of berries that they know they can just jump right into and learn about management and also have those to harvest and sell or process or whatever they want to do with them. And then we get this great, you know, planting that will be maintained and we get to pick and have more berries for our freezer. Um, we're not really interested in selling them at this point, but, you know, there's an almost unlimited amount that us and our kids could eat from the freezers. So 
And that, and it kind of sparked another, it kind of sparked a new way of thinking about this. You know, we've always approached this uh, farm incubator thing as, well, they're going to be growing annual vegetables. That's how you start a farm. You know, you start by growing annuals and that's that. And I'm thinking more and more about, well, maybe it'd be more interesting to move into a, an established woody agriculture based system. Maybe there's space between the rows to do annuals still, but um, maybe some people would really like to move into that, that that'd be a little more of a novel um, and unique um, thing to move into. So it's the question now is like, well, how much do you completely revamp the space into all perennial or do you still leave a big chunk open to have some flexibility or versatility in use? I don't know. But there's just some things I'm excited about. Yeah, that sounds like a really exciting situation for all parties involved. And as someone that currently leases an already established orchard, we found it very helpful to learn uh, how to do this type of work on already established trees that are much more forgiving um, than young trees. And we've made so many mistakes and we're just very thankful to, to have that space to make those mistakes and learn. Um, family, family JT says, we have land, forest, hills, some open space that could be used and currently is just being grazed by beef cattle. I, they'd, welcome any, they'd welcome pollinators, tree farming, or other ideas of niche markets that they're not aware of. They're also looking into making a deer and turkey hunting mm -hmm. preserve. Hmm. I don't know. I would say Kathy probably has a good model for, you know, integrating, um, animals, I mean, uh, woody, woody crops or whatever into the pastures. Um, yeah, I think for me, I, I like small ruminants because they keep down the invasives um, and I can handle them. I mean, they've got cattle, but I, I like sheep. Goats get out too easy. Um, and sheep have wool and meat, which give, having two, two crops or two products works really well for me. Um, I think you have to look around and see what your markets are, what there is a market for, or what, what you can create a market for, and what you're good at. Mm -hmm. Because there's a real steep learning curve on sheep, as you know, Darren. Sure. <sighs> yeah, I'd, and I'd say just, it sounds like you have, have a really good assortment of different sort of ecosystems, land uses on the property, and I mean... I feel like I could talk for hours about all the potential niches you have there. I mean, you could do ginseng or um, golden seal or other sort of forest farming things in the wooded section. You could potentially, if some of the woods are sort of junky, so to speak, you could potentially open some of that up um, into silvo pasture or more pasture. Um, potentially do some timber stand improvement and make some income from that. Um, and then the beef cattle, I'd say, for sure look into um, at the very least planting some really simple um, and useful fodder trees um, into the pastures. Um, it's pretty clear that um, dappled shade from trees actually increases the productivity of pastures, especially if you have the right grass species. So my first thought is honey locust, you know, plant it on 100 foot centers in your pastures and have a little like cattle proof tree cage around each one um and it's not going to get in the way with almost anything if the cows can be in with it and it's protected there's really not many much change except that you have some trees that are starting to get bigger and provide a little more shade every year and eventually um if they're grafted good female trees really high um high energy and protein um pods so i don't know that's my sort of quick top of the head thoughts on it Thanks so much, Darren and Kathy. Uh, we're actually nearing the end of our time together. We're coming right up on 12.30. And I just wanna end with uh, a fun question that might be kind of hard it, to answer because you're all our tree people. Uh, but do you have a favorite tree? 
This is always a stumper for folks. <laughs> you can provide, you can say a whole family if you need to. <laughs> uh -huh. We, I mean, we have a, I have a favorite tree, like from a nursery standpoint that I tell everybody, it's this dwarf mulberry called Girardi that is just, it's incredibly prolific fruit producer. The fruit is really tasty and the tree, we grafted on the seedling rootstock, but it only gets in the six, maybe eight feet at the most tall. Has a really cool little growth um, form, kind of bonsai-like. It's just a gorgeous little plant and can never graft enough of them. They always just fly off the shelves. Um, so, but yeah, I'd, pawpaw, pawpaw would have been my like no-brainer, like, oh yeah, favorite tree is pawpaw like five years ago, but I'm sort of shifting and liking persimmons a lot more now. So maybe I'll I'll leave it. Persimmon will be my persimmon's my favorite all, all time tree right now. <laughs> American persimmon. Aaron, you stole my tree. Uh oh, <laughs> that's not a bad thing, is it? <laughs> no, I also like oh. American plums. American plums and cherry plums. Yeah, it's true. They're really, really pretty. Really, I love the fruit. Mm -hmm. But yeah, good old American genetics. Yeah, I agree with you. And they don't get brown rot. We have we're lucky to have an old, old stand that must have been rootstock that just suckered out everywhere. And they make these awesome little ping pong ball sized plums that are tart and a little stringent and sweet. And there's no brown rot. Yeah, that's the best jam. Mm -hmm. Well, now that I am salivating over this season's wild plums. Um, I want to end by thanking you both so much for, for your time, your expertise, and all of your expansive ideas of how we can build relationships and, and build how we share, um, share our resources on the ground. So Kathy, Darren, thank you so much um, for everything that you shared with us today. And our conversation is recorded and will be on YouTube. And we welcome folks to check out uh, Darren and Kathy's farms on the web and to stay connected to the Savannah Institute online and hopefully in person at field days this year. So mm -hmm. once again, thanks Darren, thanks Kathy, and thank you everyone who joined us on the webinar today.